everybody got excited about biotechnology, I would say towards the end of the 70s. And that is when uh, the first companies were formed and perhaps the great exciting thing is that a company called Cetus raised almost a billion dollars on the market to this promising thing and of course thereupon very rapidly many companies were formed. Many and of course they were first focused on the applications of the new DNA technology, which had come out of molecular biology. And although there was a slow move, because from 1975 onwards, uh, of genetic, what's called genetic engineering or genetic manipulation. So this is how the, the biotech companies were formed, and their first their first job that they learned was to do what is essentially uh, replacement therapies. So they cloned genes that made proteins, that made insulin, that made uh, many growth factors like EPO and so on. And many of those companies did survive and they received a lot of support from the pharmaceutical companies because that was uh, a new way of producing, producing these, these proteins. And uh, the pharmaceutical companies, which were based mostly on physiology and a little bit of biochemistry and a lot of pharmacology, <coughs> Uh, had never heard of molecular biology, so they had to learn the new technology. And as in the subsequent years, with more and more and more uh, progress, then the biotechnology uh, began to change, and in fact, uh, by, I think, the beginning of this year, this century, uh, the whole scene was very different. And in fact, today, support for biotechnology is not very great. And that is the important thing, is that the people who, uh, the venture capitalists who founded all of these companies and uh, who made very great gains, uh, people in Genentech and so on, Amgen, very few of them, Biogen, a few survived into become pharmaceutical companies of their own. So I should just explain why it is important to think very hard about biotechnology in these days. Uh, because it is used to be part of the translation from basic science into applications. That is, Basic scientists would have an idea, maybe kinesins or some other group of proteins are important, and they would form a company, right? And then they would do, invest in experiments to be done. If these were successful, the company was then bought by a pharmaceutical company. But gradually, as time came, they became, they became realized that effectively the most successful way for a biotech company to succeed is in fact to discover a drug. So they got increasingly involved in drugs, uh, drug testing. They first did a lot of animal experiments to justify but every time, more and more, the pharmaceutical companies would refuse to take it up unless they had been into humans. They'd done a clinical trial. And clinical trials are very expensive to do that. So I think what has happened is because of the decline of the venture capital businesses all through the world, there is now a gap in exploitation of knowledge in universities, 
with potential applications. It's become a very expensive process if we have to go so far down in order to do it. And I think that is why, especially for many diseases, especially the neglected diseases, like malaria, which of course are diseases in countries where people do not have much money to buy medicines, this is now being done by public organizations like the Gates Foundation. Uh, the Wellcome Trust is putting money into essentially drug development. And now even uh, academic organizations like NIH are investing in drug discovery in order to fill this gap. So I think this gap is going to be important and the role of the small companies in filling this gap in the past, it needs financial support or else nothing will be able to be translated into successful uh, applications. So I think that is the crisis for what we may call medical biotechnology today. Of course, there is a whole new, as you know, the biggest thing now in medical, biomedical technology is to make proteins, especially antibodies, uh, which can then be used in treatment. And uh, that has become protein pharmaceuticals, has become very big. Uh, it is said that by 2020, something like a quarter of all the sales will be in protein pharmaceuticals for cancer, for autoimmune disease, and so on. And all the hectic buying and buying of companies has been so people can get the capacity to enter this field. And of course, this is now uh, attracting a, a good deal of attention. The problem with the protein pharmaceuticals is that they are very, very expensive. That is, the therapy costs more than, uh, even for a simple thing, costs more than $1,000 ago. Uh, they all have to be delivered intravenously, I mean, certainly in this way. So I think we have to think about medical biotech in relation to the whole of the pharmaceutical company enterprise as to where they are going. So I have a mathematical theory why all the pharmaceutical companies will disappear. Because I think they will merge until there's one pharmaceutical company and then a small fluctuation will convert that to zero. That's a good mathematical theory. But in fact now, there are fewer and fewer companies competing. They are larger and larger. They have become huge enterprises. And I think the whole question of what their standard was, which was, we make you a drug, you take it at home, preferably by mouth, and we hope you take it every day for the rest of your life. That's been their big dream. And of course, this is now not so frequent. I think there is one area we should, as scientists, be concerned with, and which is, of course, I think very threatening, which is the rise of uh, resistance, especially in microorganisms and also in viruses. That is, uh, we have now multiply resistant strains which never existed before. We have selected them. We have now run out completely uh, with antibiotics now, with, a, with vancomycin now being, being now counted by resistance of the organisms. All right, so in fact, the idea we would have an antibiotic which would kill all bacteria, which everybody could take, is disappearing. We now need antibiotics for very specific 
for very specific diseases, bacterial diseases. We need much faster diagnosis of the bacterium and its drug resistance pattern. As you all know, if you get an infection, you go into a hospital, they don't wait to get the antibiotic resistance. That takes four or five days to isolate the bacterium and test it. They start giving you the antibiotics anyway. And then they'll find out in five days whether they did the right thing. So we need, I think, even for these. So this is now becoming more and more selective medicine. In other words, there are, we'll have to select drugs for certain types of bacteria carrying certain extra genes. And I think that this is not what pharmaceutical companies are used to. They are used to making one antibiotic which everybody can take by mouth. But I think that has to change because we've now created completely new diseases uh, that never existed before, uh, which, which of course have come, not because, just come for the, are just dumping antibiotics. It's now well known that the antibiotic resistance genes have come largely through animals who have been fed antibiotics as part of food production. And they've developed resistant organisms. These have passed to us. So I leave you with those thoughts to discuss. Thank you very much.